Let's welcome Dr. Kani. Be a, um, a drama minor in, uh, in school, so hopefully that's going to suit me well. A happy World Sleep Day, everyone. Uh, very appropriate for me to be standing here jet lagged in front of you. <laughs> sleep. I'm very excited to be here. Um, hopefully, it's the same sequence. Uh, very, very excited. And uh, what a facetious question to ask why you should care about sleep in older adults. And I'm going to answer that. Um, and but really uh, spent a lot of time talking about what should we pay attention to. Um, and you know, I figured some of you may want to have my recipe for good sleep, so I'm going to share it with you. Uh, and uh, and and then talk about how we might be able to apply that in these types of settings. So why should we care about sleep in older adults? I think that's an obvious thing, but poor sleep increases the risk of uh, many things, but one, it usually precipitates um, someone's decision to enter into long-term care. Um, it is associated with cognitive decline, uh, with uh, physical decline, with a risk of falls, um, for uh, less social engagement, less uh, or poorer outcomes in our um, uh, physical rehab uh, programs, um, frailty, um, mood-related issues, in the, uh, including agitation and higher mortality rate. Um, and sleep disturbance, is, this is not surprising, is, is highly prevalent in long-term care settings. Um, in fact, the insomnia rate is double the rate that we see um, in the general population. It's probably higher than that, but that's like the diagnostic um, levels. And at least 40%, and I, I really do think these these numbers are um, are an underestimate. Um, the 40% of people um, have obstructive sleep apnea, um, but um, there's actually much higher rate once you have um, a neurocognitive disorder. So, um, and and one of the big issues is that the sleep problems are um, underdiagnosed, meaning that you know. People may know that they have a sleep problem, but in terms of what the sleep problem is and teasing them apart, that, um, that's, we have underdiagnosis or undertreatment. So we have lots of opportunities here to um, make some improvements. So I told you I would share my recipe for good sleep. And here it is. Um, the, the main thing I'm going to say is that we have to have a strong, deep sleep drive. Um, why? Um, that might seem self-explanatory to have a, a strong sleep, uh, deep sleep drive, but deep sleep is actually where we get uh, growth hormone. This is where we get tissue restoration. So we definitely want to be focusing on deep sleep. Um, and we do that with uh, increased daytime activity, believe it or not. Um, but we kind of get this. Think about with kids, right? What do we do? Go out and play. Uh, also, don't let them don't let her nap too long. She's never going to sleep tonight, right? So we have some knowledge about this. We understand what to do when we're helping people with sleep when they're kids, right? The other thing we need is um, we need to leverage our body clock. So our body clock is very important for the timing. Now, our body clock, interestingly, and I am a perfect specimen right now with my jet lag, is um, we need regular input into the clock. Otherwise we suffer from jet lag symptoms, because jet lag is not about travel. It's actually about a mismatch between the inner clock and the environmental cues. Um, the clock on the wall where you are all the time, so there's nothing to do with travel. So we need regular cues as well. And we know this. We know this. Because it would be like, you know, don't let little Colleen off her meal or sleep schedule. She's a little terror. If she, like, we get that it has to do with mood and sleep and eating and everything, right? You're not going to have a a, uh, a dinner party and say, you know, having a dinner party tomorrow, bring your toddler, dinner's at eight. <laughs> now, why is there nervous laughter in that there's no way you're going because there's going to be problems. So we understand about the relationship between mood and the clock. So we need to have that, right? Now, um, these are the two regulatory systems for sleep. And it is true, with high levels of arousal, 
it's the emergency system that can override these two systems temporarily. It's not like a long-term thing. This is a good thing, because this is so you can uh, address an emergency, right? If someone's breaking in your house, you don't want to say, well, I do have a strong deep sleep drive, and this is the ideal window <laughs> for my sleep. Let's, you know, let's see how this shakes out. You want to be able to inhibit sleep, deal with the emergency, you know, and, and whatever. So you do, you know, it is ideal to have a protective wind down period before bed. And, and of course, this is, again, we know this, right? Somebody comes in, starts roughhousing with your kids. You're like, you know, you know, I'm trying to like get them to settle down. Like, you get, you know, get out of here. So we kind of get this. And here's the thing. We think that we outgrow these two regulatory systems. No, this is, these are literally the regulatory systems for sleep. So that's the problem we actually have in adulthood is that we don't understand. We make sleep really complicated. So I'm going to make it really easy with these very technical, technical graphs uh, and explain how these systems work. The first thing I'm going to explain is what, uh, what is actually called the homeostatic system for sleep because it's a balancing system. But I don't want to put you to sleep, so I'm going to call it the deep sleep driving system. This is the system that makes up for lost sleep. And unfortunately, we think that we make up for lost sleep with more sleep, and that is factually untrue. We actually make up for lost sleep with increased deep sleep the next day, which you may or may not be able to perceive. And that's where a lot of anxiety comes from, because if you have a bad night's sleep, and the next night you don't sleep more, you're only paying attention to the hours of sleep, then you think you have it. And so then you try to make up for lost sleep. And that's where a lot of our problems with insomnia start. So I'm going to um, explain how the system works and you know, can we leverage this in this setting, okay? So why do you think of it like this? So from the moment you're awake and active and out of bed, you're building a drive for deep sleep, okay? Think of it like you, your responsibility is to blow up a balloon full of deep sleep drive and sleepiness. So that when you go to bed, your balloon is nice and full and taut. And when you let go of that balloon, it is associated with sleep pressure and the production of deep sleep. Now, deep sleep is called delta sleep or N3 sleep, slow wave sleep. They're all the same term for deep sleep. And this is where we get tissue restoration, growth hormone. Okay. If uh, this system, I said, is homeostatic, means it balances. So it's, it's monitoring your rest and activity. If you want to send a message to it to get more deep sleep, then that means you have to engage in more physical activity and less time in bed in the 24-hour period. Okay? If you want it to produce less deep sleep, then uh, and you want to have light sleep, then spend a lot of time resting and a lot of time in bed. Okay. Now, this is really tricky because this is the opposite of what we think. Mm -hmm. And now I want you to think about residents, especially those who also have physical issues as well, and the well-intended message of rest, 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 rest when you feel tired. But I want to ask you this. If I said tomorrow your prescription is to spend all day on the couch, <clears throat> sounds fantastic. But I want you to think about it. Would you feel energized after the full day or sluggish? Do you understand the way this works? So this is also about fatigue. Okay? All right, so now that we've covered that very technical system, let's move on to the body clock, and I'm going to try and integrate these two systems together so you can see how you can use some hacks to get, into these, to, work, to get better sleep. So the second system is the body clock, the circadian system. We have clocks all over our body. Um, they don't look like that, obviously. Um, and they are coordinated in the brain. Okay? They are genetic. Um, they, these, this system is implicated in hormones and mood and the timing of sleep, uh, the optimal window. That's called, actually called your chronotype. You want to know what a chronotype is? I'm gonna, I'll, I'll demonstrate it right now. Um, how many people, uh, with show of hands, are a night owl? And before you put your hand up, I'm going to define that. So that would mean that you get sleepy later than midnight, and you go to bed later than midnight, and you would wake up, you know, at eight o'clock or later, as long as you didn't have to work. 
join me night owls. Yeah, so we got yeah, a handful. Wait, I did not know that you were a night owl. This is interesting information. <laughs> 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 uh, now my early birds. My early birds are going to be that you get sleepier and fall asleep before 10, meaning that you would wake up naturally around 6. Do I have any early birds? I don't know. Now, everyone else who didn't put their hand up, you are what we call an intermediate, which is a very sexy term, same, like meaning that you are somewhere between 10 and midnight, right? That's what most of us are throughout our adult. It is genetic, but it's also developmental. Meaning, little kids are little kids, night owls or early birds. They could be a night owl because it's genetic. Mm -hmm. But what are most kids? Early birds. It's very early, in fact, right? It's like 7 o'clock. You go down and get up early, right? Okay. Now, what a great insight. You can have a kid that is a genetic night owl. Now, they will go to bed later and rise later than their other baby counterparts, their kid counterparts. But they're still going to be earlier than they are going to be when they get into their teen years. Because what happens during puberty? Are they early birds? Oh, no, ma'am. No, ma'am. They, night owls. Okay, because puberty is formal. Okay? Um, we like to blame teens for this, but it is absolutely developmental. Now, so our night owl, and now imagine what they're going to be like, because now they might have school problems. Because for them, they cannot sleep early. And they're being woken up early for early start times. And this is where we get a lot of our issues, right? Now, um, now as we age, so during most of our adulthood, we're going to be in the middle. But I am genetically an advanced phase person, means I'm an, I'm an extreme early bird. So I am earlier relative to most of my peers. But as I age, it's going to become a lot more obvious I'm an early bird. Because what happens in older adults? What is the early bird special? <laughs> it is eating early, because eating is part of this too. Going to bed early, rising early. That will happen also in adulthood. So, we have that, that's part of this system. So we do have a window that's genetic, but it does move around a little bit developmentally speaking. Okay? But this system is also like a daily system, and this system is longer than 24 hours. And so it needs constant input into it to confirm what time it is. Right now, my clock is annoyed with me because it is noticing that the sun is in a place right now where it shouldn't be because I came in last night from Ontario, okay? So how do you think I feel today? Tell me about jet lag. What, yell out some symptoms. Yeah. Uneasy. Yeah. Uneasy? Yeah. Uneasy, so yeah. my mood, yeah, my yeah. Mood, right? Yeah, don't get me mad. <laughs> sure. <laughs> And uh, what else? Mood? Sluggish. Sluggish. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so my energy isn't, isn't the greatest. It's World Sleep Day, so I'm riding that high. But emotionally, I mean, just. You know. But what else? You're tired, cognitively, not as sharp. Sensitive. Sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, but I mean, I'm sensitive in stomach. Uh, sensitive in mood, uh, can't sleep when I want to, can't wake up when I want to, want, you know, so there's lots of things that are going to be um, happening. It's going to be a roller coaster today. Now, you can have jet lag without traveling because it's not about traveling. It's a, it, it is the, these are the symptoms that we get when there's a mismatch between the clock in your body and the clock on the wall the whole time. So if you, if you are variable in your habits, then you are going to suffer from jet lag and not know it. If you don't believe me, think about Mondays. Everyone blames for Monday. But think about what you typically do in terms of bedtimes and rise times on Sunday versus Monday. So Saturday night, 
go out late, not make some early bird, but go out late, yeah. right? Yeah. So great, right? Sunday night, oh, I'm going to get it together. I got uh, work tomorrow. So it would be like 2 a.m., 10 p.m. I'm too tired to do the math. I think that's four hours, right? So that would be the equivalent of Halifax to Vancouver, right? We blame Monday, but it is actually the jet lag symptoms that you're feeling on Monday is that. It's the variability, okay? We don't outgrow it. What we're, what we're doing for our toddlers, we don't outgrow. We just blame it on different things, okay? So we need regular input. Now, another thing you should know about the system that's very interesting is that it is sending out alerting signals all through the day of growing intensity. And it is competing with the sleepiness that you're building from the other system. And that's why you don't fall asleep during the day, unless you have narcolepsy, which there's an issue with this particular issue, yeah? Okay, so let's put them together. Um, I don't, don't strain your eyes reading all of this, it's boring. I'm just, let, I'm just showing off showing you that I know what factors contribute to long-term care issues. <laughs> I'm going to come back to this, though. I'm going to apply some of these things that you just learned to these systems, okay? Because those systems and these factors are going to interact. And I'm going to show you how. Again, with my very scientific graphs. Now, I want you to imagine... If you're feeling really tired, or if you feel like you have had a bad night and you should make up for lost sleep and you go to bed early, what happens with your balloon? Do you have just as much in it if you go to bed early? No, you have a squishy balloon. Now what does a squishy balloon do? It's hard to predict. For some people, it will take them longer to fall asleep. For most middle-aged people, that's not what happens. They are able to fall asleep within normal limits. They burn through their first cycle, maybe two, right, an hour or two, and then they are wide. And let's just, let's just hang out here for a few hours because the first half of the night is all this system, the second half of the night is the clock. So you have to wait for that system to kick in and you're going to be spending some time. Anybody can relate to that? Mm -hmm. um, Yes, I can relate to that. Now, so that's a problem. So there's going to be less quality sleep, less deep sleep, less growth hormone, less restoration. If you have pain, you are going to be aches, have aches and pains on top of your pain, and your threshold for pain will be different. You'll be more pain sensitive, right? Because no tissue restoration. Now I want you to imagine what happens when you sleep in or, or lay in. You don't have to be sleeping because you're not active. So you're delaying the buildup of your drive for sleep, and you're cutting back on the amount that will go into your balloon, right? Because you're, you're getting up later. So what's going to happen, my friends, a squishy balloon? So the same things can happen, right? Naps. Okay, you start building up a drive for deep sleep. You, uh, especially if you do it right after lunch during the post-lunch dip, so that's a a body clock, a phenomenon where our body clock dips, and so we are we are more able to sleep right after lunch. It's not about lunch. So you know, again, you're like, all right, feeling a little sleepy, take my nap. You cannot control when you let go of the balloon. You can't control how much comes out. Okay? And the amount that you typically lose that night is exponential. So even if you had a five minute nap, we can't actually. Uh, determine how much you're going to lose. So now you have to start building all over again. And for most people, they're not able to build up enough sleep drive, and we're, we're stuck with this squishy balloon situation. Now, I can tell by faces, and by doing this many, many times, that I've become unpopular. This is, this is, the, this is the breaking point where people don't like me to say anything bad about now. So I'm going to try and save my... My, I'm going to do some impression management here. Um, naps. Naps are like cupcakes. Yeah. <laughs> right? There's nothing wrong with a cupcake. They're delightful, especially in moderation. Okay? Cupcakes in the context of diabetes are a little different. Right? So, nothing wrong with a nap. 
if you're a good sleeper, right? Um, it's not positive for sleep, but if you're a good sleeper, hey, it's fine, right? And in fact, we use naps in people who have certain sleep disorders. We actually use them prescriptively. Um, somebody who has like sleep apnea, for example, and they have sleepiness during the day, especially if they're driving or they're doing something dangerous, we're gonna ask them to do it. For those of you who do night shifts, we're gonna ask you to nap pre-shift. And we, are we doing that for sleep? No, we're napping for sleepiness. We're napping to get rid of the, the accumulated sleepiness so that post-nap you can perform, whether it be on a shift or whatever, okay? Um, and it is true that the briefer and earlier in the day, the less sleep disruptive it is, but it's still gonna be sleep disruptive, okay? But for those people who have low deep sleep drive, people with insomnia, people with chronic pain, um, uh, and uh, older adults, it is like snacking rather than having a meal, okay? And so that's a, that's a no, right? So don't get mad at anybody your naps. You can have your naps. I'm just saying that they're not good in certain people, yeah? Okay, now, if you can imagine for some of your uh, residents, um, there's going to be a variety of mobility issues, medical issues, etc. Okay, um, but sleeping during the day and inactivity is going to be associated with a squishy balloon. Okay, it's going to take away. Now, if some of these issues are related to pain, etc., then it's going to make it even worse because no growth hormone. Um, I did a study once in chronic fatigue syndrome, and we did four sessions of cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia, and the main thing we did was restrict uh, time in bed in the 24-hour period, and one of the things that we found, in addition to the improved sleep, was that we then found in the blood um, uh, increased metabolites of growth hormone. So it was like, wow, just that four session was enough to restore uh, their growth hormone. Now, I'm going to complain about something. Many people talk about how uh, it's just part of life uh, uh, that you're not going to sleep well as you age and that um, adults don't need, uh, older adults don't need sleep as much and they don't need uh, deep sleep. Now, I find this a little offensive because it is true, and they always use um, a, a graph that looks a little bit like this, and what it really is, is that um, N3 is deep sleep, okay? So that is the stage they're referring to. And you see how it's kind of, you know, very, very, very low in, in the last few decades that it looks at, okay? So as we're getting a less retirement age and older. But what I think is really important to notice is that simultaneously the time in bed has increased. So their sleep need has not increased, their time in bed has, and it has resulted in low deep sleep. Uh, low de deep sleep. So I find it very offensive that people have not considered what healthy aging would look like. Healthy sleep aging would be increasing activity to, to whatever manageable amount would be for you, but to decrease time in bed in the 24 hour period. Um, and so I don't buy the idea that, you know, we just have to give up on sleep as we age. Like, that does not make any sense. Um, now, some of the fun work that Jessica and I do at, at um, Talk Tech is we like to think about um, what we're getting from, uh, from the sensors in terms of, like, people being in bed and out bed. Now, this is something I just found so fascinating. So this is just, and it was just kind of a random thing that we pulled up. This is somebody, uh, and this is when they're in bed and out of bed, okay? On the, on the left-hand side. This is over 13 hours in bed. Now, this is what we would see in a uh, pretty young elementary school child, okay? And they could, from a growth hormone perspective, probably fill up that amount of time and produce deep sleep during that time. So that is realistic. But for somebody, you know, for most adults, we're, they can't usually produce more than six to nine hours on average. So this would be an incredibly amount, a uh, long amount of time to be in bed. 
It means that they only have less than 11 hours to blow up that balloon during the day. Okay, so this would have implications for deep sleep and quality, and probably insomnia. And you do see them getting up quite a bit. Um, that's what the rule is. Now, um, I didn't plan this. We just happened to look at their daytime. This is their daytime. So this is a, the same 24-hour period as this person. And they have, an, on average, they're going into their nocturnal bed about seven hours on average. Okay? Now, so if you put all the time that they're in bed, which is over 20 hours a day, the amount of time that they have left over to actually accumulate any sleep drive, it, it's just not possible. Not possible. Um, so when we think about some of the factors, and I, I haven't put up some of the medical issues that are underlying some of this behavior, because some of this could be med medically based, yes? Um, some of the behavioral uh, factors are reduced physical activity. Uh, um, social activity is something that we often use in these types of studies that you're probably familiar to increase activity. Um, lots of time in bed and napping. Um, and also spending a lot of that time, when we look at the actual finer tuned data from, from the sensors, we also see that there, it's just really very light and waking up, okay? So lots of factors there that we can be thinking about. From the clock, there's a few things that happen as we age. One is the phase advance I told you about. We become more and more early birds. Now, what's the implication of that? Well, if you are in denial about this, and you still try and use your habitual bedtime, right? Then, and because I just, I used to have a roommate um, named Mom who was 85. And she had a bedtime of 11, but I watched The Wheel and Jeopardy with her. And that's really when bedtime started, right? But oh, I'm not sleeping, I'm not sleeping. And she would wake up at 4 and think she had terminal insomnia, and they tried to put her on an antidepressant, and I said, no, 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 no. First of all, early morning awakenings, is that's a myth that it is a predictive of, of depression, as old thinking. So this is not depression. You actually have to have depression to have depression. Second, you slept for like eight hours. You just went to bed at 11. Okay, so the dozing is something that's really, that we see. Now, so if, you, if you're not aware of that. Now, some people do go to bed too early, right? They're bored, depressed, pain. There's lots of, uh, lots of reasons to do it. But when you do that, um, um, I didn't want to bring all my memory slides, but essentially alertness is sort of, it, it hits a peak in the evening and then starts to fall. So when you go to bed early, and this is you all too, not just older adults, you are going to bed very close to the maximal peak of alertness from the alerting system. Okay? It's starting to fall, but it's still high. So unless you have an incredibly strong balloon, you're competing with it. So you're unlikely to be able to fall asleep quickly, and if you do, it's going to be light stages of sleep, and there's going to be lots of problems. Okay? But most importantly, we need regular activities. We are still those toddlers that needed the regularity. We just have convinced ourselves we don't. So regular activities helps. Regular in and out of bed helps. Regular meals help. Light exposure helps. That is the major input into the clock is through the eyes, through the optic nerve. Um, again, same thing. Um, uh, we sound like nerves that we just look at this data um, all the time. <laughs> but but we were just curious. And the same person we looked at when they got in and went out of bed. And we can see that there's a three hour variability in the time that this person is getting into bed, which would produce similar symptoms. Sleep cognitive, mood, all of these types of symptoms, as my trip that I took last night, yeah? And so um, that that's, has implications for mental health and physical health, right? And then when I looked at the rise time, um, it was about two hours of variability. So again, it would be like trauma Calvary-ish, yeah? So this person would have a lot of complaints 
that are actually related to the variability. So this is another thing that we need to think about. So in these long-term care facilities, we're just like, oh, the long-term care facilities, all the problems. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> some of it is just, just some very easy sort of adjustments that we can make here, right? They do have advanced sleep phase. Yeah, that is uh, an issue. But there, there does tend to be a weakening of circadian entrainment, but we can increase our regular activities to help with this. And some of it is due to limited exposure to bright light. Not in this facility, this facility is gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Like there's so much light in here, which is really what we need to be thinking about in these types of facilities, that's amazing. Um, and also there's some visual impairments that impact how much light is actually able to get through, right? So the cataracts, et cetera, would have a negative impact. Okay, so there's lots of ways in which we can actually make an impact. All right, the last thing I'm gonna say is just about conditioned arousal. So um, there's increased time awake spent in bed. This is really a, a little bit about insomnia, but not all, okay? So um, I, knew I, I knew I didn't have much time, so this is a bit of a teaser. And I didn't want to go into all the research. This is much of what my research is. So instead, we're going to play a game, a game in which there are no winners. It's called Cognitive Arousal Jeopardy. Uh, what people say is I get into bed, boom, and it's like a light goes off, and my brain is And so to give you a sense of what that looks like, here are the categories for our game. Ways in which people have wronged me. <laughs> Strange noises. <laughs> Diseases I probably <laughs> My endless money troubles. Why did I say or do that? Or ideas for a screenplay. <laughs> now, you can tell that this is not a negative. Some of it is just noticing noises. Some of it is inspiration. But you can't play a game of cognitive browser jeopardy uh, and win. Right? So we need to have strategies for that. Now, one thing I will say is that the major factor for insomnia is not what everyone says it is. It's not, you know, you have a stressor and anxiety. Stressor. It's not about that. That can be the initial cause, absolutely. But the major thing that determines insomnia is conditioned arousal. And conditioned arousal, and that, for those of you who have ever taken a psychology course, think about Pavlov. In his dogs, okay? So I can give it, I can show a dog meat and the dog will drool. I don't have to teach that, it's just gonna happen, right? But I can show a dog meat and ring a bell at the exact same time, over and over and over again. And eventually, I can just ring a bell and that dog's gonna drool. Now it shouldn't, bells aren't tasty, yes? It is formed an association. If your bed is paired with wakefulness over and over again, right, i.e. everything happens in that bed, then bed doesn't equal sleep. That's about the best way I can put it, okay? So bed equals wake. So you can get into bed, and it's like a, a light book goes off in your head. If you, some of you are nodding, so some of you have conditioned arousal. If you feel sleepy when you're not in the bed, you get in the bed and you're wide awake, or cognitive arousal jeopardy, you know, you hear the theme song, you have conditioned arousal. So what, your bed has become this place where you don't sleep. So we do need to protect the bed for nocturnal sleep only. There are challenges in the setting for this, but this is something to be thinking about creatively. So what can we do? What has been done, all right, as I wrap up here? Um, some, okay, I'm gonna go through a few of them. One of them is to focus on movement and social activity, and especially trying it at different times, uh, times of the day and seeing what impact it can have. Now, when you use exercise and social activity, you're targeting both the clock and the, the homeostatic system, the deep sleep driving system. You're building time out of bed, but you're also putting something into place that can be a time cue, right? Because it tends to happen at the same time as interventions. A lot of them, they use people from the local university who are like exercise physiologists or whatever, and they just come in for an internship and they lead like a little, you know, an activity session or something, right? So it's gonna be at the same time. So uh, uh, this is Kathy Richards' study. Um, a lot of these started in the 2000s, a lot of these studies. So she did an hour or so 
um, where she just came in um, during uh, the post-lunch dip that I told you about after lunch, where most people start to nap, okay? Um, and, um, and, the, and it was just social activity. Um, planned with, and it was well lit. This, these were in nursing homes, and they were able to successfully decrease the napping. They did a follow up study, um, of, actually, a series of follow up studies, and they, um, they tested exercise. And I mean, the exercise is very moderate, I mean, very sort of modified rate. And it was um, um, five days a week, so every other day was walking. I think there was two days of walking, and the other ones was just sort of a social, like, like just sort of using some bands and some balls and stuff like that, right? And uh, they did it in 165 facilities. I think this was the group out in California. And this was for, I'm trying to look how long this one was. Oh, seven weeks, so almost two months. And they found that it improved um, sleep time, um, but it increased deep, slow wave sleep. And that is, that, that is the magic. There. That's what we need to do, right? It's not about increasing sleep, it's about increasing quality sleep. But um, on memory tests, they, they improved. Uh, so on neuropsychological testing. So that is amazing. Um, the, uh, then they tested um, structured social activity plus exercise. This was uh, longer programming in continued care, and they found um, the same thing. So this, there's lots of different ones they've tried. And so as a result, they had started kind of moving a lot of these together to, uh, to um, attack both the clock and, and, the, um, uh, and the deep sleep drive. Um, and then to, to go after some of the environmental ones as well, like, I mean, because sometimes there is like kind of lit, noisy environments. Um, so sometimes there are some issues um, that just relate to uh, things that have to get done, you know? Um, but anyway, there, there are things like reducing the time in bed during the day, in the 20, in basically in the 24-hour period, increasing ideally sunlight exposure, not always uh, possible, at least bright light exposure, um, physical activity, and having some routines, okay? Um, and I'll tell you about some of them. Uh, one was a five-day intervention. Uh, again, this is Kathy Alessi. And what she found was that they decreased um, uh, awakenings, but also the duration of awakenings, which is great. Whenever you've got awakenings, and you, you remember the goal of getting out of bed, we always worry about falls, and they, and then, then there's issues with staffing, right? Like, so people, uh, having to manage people uh, um, out of bed. Um, and also a decreased uh, daytime napping, which is really important. Um, and interestingly, um, the greatest amount of, of improvement was predicted by the greatest amount of, um, of activity um, that, was, that was engaged in, okay? Um, in um, one that um, just for two weeks, which is such a low amount of time, they did structured and physical activity in the morning and in the evening, and found that there was increased deep sleep, deep, slow-wave sleep, which is amazing, um, and improvement on memory tasks. And uh, another two-week intervention where um, I believe that they right, kind of divided people across facilities into doing either the morning or the evening and compared it. And, um, and what they found was that in, if you did it in the morning, they, they uh, reported that their sleep got better. Um, and there was improvements on cognitive tasks um, on four out of eight cognitive tasks that they tried the neuropsych testing. Um, evening uh, activity did even better. Um, so same sleep improvement, but also um, seven out of eight tests. So there's lots of uh, possibility for uh, improvement. So now it now comes to the BuzzFeed uh, portion of my talk where I'm going to give you some tips to, to wrap up, okay? So ways to avoid that cognitive arousal is prote uh, protecting the stimulus value of the bed for sleep. That is nerve talk for bed equals sleep, okay? Um, we always say that sex can be the exception, but it, generally speaking, we, like your bed should be the place where you sleep. Um, so when we can encourage people to be 
out of that bed, maybe um, transfer to a chair or transfer to another room. Um, uh, you know, even if it was to move that bed out of the room so that it's like some sort of different association, that would be helpful. And obviously a wind down. From a clock perspective, having a regular rise time is one of the best things that you can do for yourself. Uh, that doesn't vary too much on the weekend. Um, for my night owls, that's not possible, right? Because the, during the week, you're getting up at a time that's a mismatch. Um, so the way you can sleep a little bit on the, on the weekend. Um, but generally speaking, we should keep it, keep it regular, right? We should be getting some daylight sunlight every day. Um, the blue light that everyone says is so bad is it, it actually vital, crucial for health. Um, trying to have regular meals and around the same time and regular activities, which would include social activities. This is, these are great um, interventions. And my last one about deep sleep tips. I mean, it's probably self-explanatory. Um, planning and uh, manageable, because everyone's going to be very different in, in, uh, in, in what they can do physically, yeah. Um, and social activities ways that are going to sort of blow up that balloon and limiting time in bed during, uh, during the 24 hour period. The sleep need is pretty low. Um, and so we want the sleep to be filled with quality, not quantity. Um, and napping um, is, is really something that, generally speaking, we want to discourage. Um, particularly in the afternoon and the early evening when you have a high propensity to nap. So those are called forbidden zones. So this is why um, some of these um, activities were planned during that time. And, and some of the barriers in some facilities um, were, uh, a staff, there were staffing changeovers um, in the sort of uh, middle of the afternoon and in the evening that, um, and that's why sometimes some of this programming was well, students were brought in uh, in order to deal with that, right? So students who are doing, um, you know, kinesiology degrees, etc. Um, so, in wrapping up, a return to my recipe. Um, we have two systems: a deep sleep driving system that balances rest and activity. If you want to send a message for low quality sleep and not very much deep sleep, unfortunately. Um, the way that you do it is decreasing your activity and spending a lot of time in bed, which is what a lot of people with insomnia do, but it's what a lot of people in long-term care facilities do, but for a lot of reasons, and there's lots of good reasons even. Um, so we're going to try and increase time out of bed and activity, um, or look for ways to try and do that. At a body clock, we have both a sort of an idiosyncratic window inside of ourselves, that is influenced developmentally, so definitely there's a delay, uh, or there's an advanced phase. So way even you will become more of a morning person as you, as you get a little bit older, but not that much. Um, and we need to make sure that we're regular. Otherwise, we're, we're suffering from jet lag. A lot of what people are complaining about during the day is actually about this. It's about jet lag without the scenery without the travel. At least I got to come to beautiful Vancouver for this one. And lastly, arousal, right? We need this system. It's an emergency system. But if, if, when the, if we don't wind down before bed, um, and if we pair the bed with wakefulness, uh, or we're pairing it with cognitive arousal jeopardy, right? Then unfortunately, uh, we're going to have issues. So we're going to try and protect the bed for sleep only. Um, I know that's an unpopular thing, people love their bed. And, and winding down um, before bed. Um, my friends, that's it. Um, I'd love to answer some questions. I don't know if I'm going to do it now or at the very end, but it, what, what's better, Jessica? Uh, now, we have now. about 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, as we get into questions. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I have a question. I want to know the research you did was based on. I'm sorry? 
the research, sorry, the research study you were mentioning, was it based in Toronto? Um, so none of the studies today uh, are my studies. Yeah, so none of them are done. I was just thinking, um, is there any studies like um, comparing village versus city, western versus eastern on the street? No, uh, not what I know of, but I think one thing that's incredibly important for us to think about is that the sleep regulatory system is the sleep regulatory system, period. So in these, these fundamental facts, are going to be the same no matter what. So it's really going to be the challenges um, that are going to differ. So for example, it's much easier for you. Well, no, that's not true. I was about to say it's much easier for you to get sunlight. <laughs> that is ridiculous. Uh, I think you're enough to know uh, about the dreariness. But so, so what I'm saying is, is that so some places, for example, a lot of those studies were done in California. So there's a lot of work being done at UCLA, et cetera. And so they, they're, uh, they're a lot more able to use um, natural daylight in a lot of their interventions. And a lot of other ones just have to pay attention to lighting on the unit and making sure that, you know, and, and, and doing some of the activity um, in rooms that actually have access to out, um, out in the light and stuff. So, the interventions um, that leverage the sleep systems are are going to be different, whether you're in a, a city or, or whatever. Um, it's the challenges that are going to be different depending on the geographic locale. And I would say just like, and, and each setting I think is going to be different. Um, and, and so I think coming up with something that works well in, um, uh, in, in your particular setting is the thing that's important. Yeah. Yeah, just, just a bigger reflection on uh, what we have presented, homeostasis body clock in uh, the low self. And applying it clinically, uh, I brought my our team from the Stat Center. We were some acute unit okay. at the uh, University of British Columbia Hospital. Okay. And we're trying a sensor. Uh, to our units, yeah. and uh, just a reflection on that, and uh, the contribution to the care that we provide to our patients is really essential, yeah. given the structure that you provided. Yeah. Uh, the, but poor sleep really impacts, you know, physical, mental, and uh, the cognitive function of the patient, yes. and the, the overall uh, function. Yeah. ability of the patient. So, uh, our contribution as an inter interdisciplinary team uh, creates this sense of uh, capacity for our patients to rehabilitate from what they have psychiatrically and, uh, uh, and medically. And we've seen that a lot in our clinical setting. Yeah. I, can, uh, I kind of uh, draw to your example of protecting the bed because sometimes we get patients who are depressed or some depressed uh, symptoms yeah. and they associate uh, uh, the bed as a time for them to eat yeah. or some activities that they do at night and we yeah. do our rounds by the way every 30 minutes from which also impacts uh, yeah. Yeah. sleep uh, yeah. a few 30 rounds that's why we're trying to see whether a remote monitoring uh, reduces that sleep disturbances of yeah. our uh, patients so, uh, in the activity that we provide, I mean, the, the care staff would always gather the patient and initiate activities during the day, uh, creates that balloon that you yeah. made mention of yeah. uh, to induce that sleep uh, later in the evening. Yeah. And, and truly, it impacts, we've seen them participating more the next day because yeah. our unit is an assessment unit. We are a geriatric assessment unit, so our role as an interdisciplinary team and as bedside carers yeah. to make sure that they have this big balloon so they yeah. can sleep. Yeah. So that tomorrow when they engage with the physicians, yeah. they can 
be cognitively tested, <laughs> they can proceed to uh, like yeah. radiology exam, etc. And so yeah. they can be taken care of during the day. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you know, these are essential that kind of reflects on what we basically do at bedside. Oh, I Thank love you this. For that. I love on. that so much. And and you know, and and keep in mind. I mean, I've not. I didn't talk about a single medical disorder. I didn't talk about all of the other disorders of the, the, I didn't characterize the sleep disorders that occur on the unit. The obstructive sleep apnea, periodic limb movement, REM behavior disorder that we see a lot in our cognitive disorders and all of the multiple things that we're doing. So, so we're just talking about the basics here, but you've noticed even in the basics in terms of what an impact trying to increase daytime sleep, uh, daytime activity, um, this is why we don't call sleep disorders sleep disorders anymore. We call them sleep wake disorders because it's understanding it's about 24 hours. And so that's where we have our impact. And um, if slow wave sleep, if you want somebody to heal from something, they need the slow wave sleep. That when you deprive somebody of slow wave sleep, it's very similar to what we see you know, in smokers and, and, and in terms of how much of a challenge it is to get them to heal from, from a wound or something like that, right? So. It is very similar. So you de decrease, if I took everyone in this room and I, and I deprived you of slow wave sleep selectively, I was an evil scientist, <laughs> then what you would complain about is you would complain about myalgias, okay? Uh, the aches. And so uh, a lot of my work has been in fibromyalgia to show that when we can uh, increase their activity and get rid of their insomnia, that uh, in those studies that came out of Duke, not only did they sleep well, of course, um, but their pain got better, but it's not just their rated pain. We actually did it on a tender point exam with, um, with uh, sham tender points too, so that there's no way they could be faking. So it actually showed up on the tender point exam. Um, and in the subset that we did blood work, their, um, their uh, growth hormone metabolite was, was increased. It was basically not detectable previously. So what we know is if I had done that to you and you would start to complain about aches and pains on the order of like fibromyalgia, you also, when if I, because I'm an evil scientist, I'm putting you through some uh, pain things like uh, pain paradigms, like shocks, your ability to uh, take the shock or your rating of how uh, painful the shock is changes. So you become much more pain sensitive. Your threshold is changed as a result of this one mechanism. So one of the major things that we wanna do and that we do, and I, I love, that's why I love working with chronic pain and depression, is really targeting the 24 hour period to get them to get that growth hormone secretion. Yeah. Um. What's your personal take on the daylight saving time when people get to stay Any advocacy to, from your team of experts to the government to, to say stop <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. So we do, we do ask, we're like, like the, from a health perspective. I mean, so daylight savings time is one of the examples I use to show people how you suffer from jet lag without travel. Because people are like, oh, because I've lost sleep. And I'm like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. That's not what's happening. Why do you feel it on both ends? Why, why do we feel it fall and spring? Why? It's not about losing sleep. It is about the mismatch in your body with the clock on the wall. It's one hour. So somebody's like, well, I, you know, it's not a big deal. I only have a few hours variability. I'm like, a few hours? What happens during daylight savings? That's one hour. Do you feel it? Yes. Now, it's mild. It goes away. It's, it's not a big deal. But if you do it on a day-to-day -day basis and you're constantly like, I go to bed 10 here and then midnight here and then 11 here and then 9 here and then whatever, what's happening, in addition to what's being affected in terms of your balloon, Right? Because sometimes your balloon's going to be bigger because you stay up. Is the variability of the cue of getting into bed. So daylight savings time is one of those things. Daylight savings is one of those things that, you know, there's not an advantage um, from a health perspective, and there's only a disadvantage. It's not a big deal, but for those people who have 
um, other issues, it is going to throw them off for like a week or so. Yeah. Um, so for a potential resident from the community, mm -hmm. their bed in their mind is where they sleep in their home. Mm -hmm. Now they're transferring to long term care with the bed is quite clean for them, and right now their mind is not adjusting to that environment. So it is very common for residents in long term care coming in that they don't have a good sleep for a week or so. Yes. Is there any clinical study that was done on the average state that a person in long term care is able to adapt to environments and have a good sleep? So I'm unfamiliar with that specifically. I can't imagine there wouldn't be, but I'm, I'm not familiar. I don't have one at, at my fingertips. But what I'll say is that there are probably a number of factors, and that one of, um, including the adjustment, not just to your bed. Yeah, so it's a new, so, so I think there's a lot of reasons. And, and many people report having difficulty sleeping in, for example, a hotel or, or something like that, a new environment. Um, and we know that controllability is another part of it. So if they don't perceive that they have a lot of control in their new environment, which frequently is the case, um, then people are going to struggle. So that's the emotional side. But if you want to ask just from a, um, a sleep perspective, then what, then what I would be saying to that person is, in addition to all the, the emotional stuff that we kind of have to, to, to adapt to, we sure do need a strong balloon. So I would be really encouraging them to be, um, you know, checking out all the new programming, um, making sure you're down for meals to kind of really kind of get used to um, uh, and make, meet new people, and um, so so that you would have those things into place um, uh, while you're making the adjustment. And I think that would be a, a very good thing to do. But I do think they're going to have an adjustment, just like. You know, a kid going off to camp, or um, uh, you, you know, sleeping in a hotel room, or whatever. Yeah. But the balloon will help. Yes. There's one question yeah. here. Yeah. Oh, sorry. You've got these So yeah. I have a curious, an idea. I obviously have to get through the night to me out of my room because <laughs> that probably doesn't help. And then I think about the um, seniors in long term care, and they all have. Or most of them have a television in their room, and um, I guess we're going to have to get some recliners or, or chairs, you know, instead of going into their beds. But so that's one of my thoughts. But also, have, in any of your studies, have you noticed any difference in seasons? Because I know, even for myself, I'm not as active in the winter, but more active, you know, in the summer months. Yes, absolutely. So there's, and that, that sort of relates to what was being asked over here, too. I mean, I think just. There, um, there are, there does tend to be increased time in bed and decreased activity in the winter. Now, I want to, I want to, I want to do throw a cupcake up there, mainly because I'm a TV watcher in bed. But anyway, um, a cupcake about the TV. Um, so, for good sleepers, um, a TV, a TV watching, reading in bed, all of these things that you've heard is so bad. There's no evidence that that's true in a good sleeper. Moreover, if you get rid of it, it doesn't help somebody with insomnia either. So sleep hygiene is the most disseminated treatment on the internet. Okay? Sleep hygiene not only doesn't work, but it is what uh, as the American Academy, we came out two years ago and said, please stop using this, and, and definitely don't use it on its own. Um, and when, you know, so there's a few of us that do clinical trials in the area of cognitive behavior therapy, um, and I'm one of them. When I'm testing cognitive behavior therapy against a sham placebo treatment, my sham is sleep hygiene. Because I know, because it's the most disseminated treatment on the internet and in doctor's offices, that people will have heard of it and will think that it works. So that's what you need for a sham, right? You need credibility. But I also know it won't work, so that I will be able to show that my treatment is better than that. And so, um, it's, so I don't want anyone to think this is about TVs. This is about um, if your everything is about the bed, right? So when they are in, like, because some people are going to have to be in there, right? So you don't want to like not have, you don't want to have like an impoverished environment. 
There's no evidence that good sleepers and poor sleepers differ on sleep hygiene. So when I say protecting the bed for sleep, the worst offenders are people who are during work life who, you know, like answer work emails and do and teens that do homework and all these other things in bed. Um, people, uh, somebody was just telling me about depression and of sort of going to the bed um, uh, and going to the bed, especially for an escape. If you're going to bed for escape, you're feeling overwhelmed, you get in the bed, relief, short term. Long term, the bed is the place where, uh, you know what I mean, like I have to recruit them. And so they become, like in the 24 hour period, very little time out of the bed. So I don't think you have to get rid of TVs in rooms. No, I, I really don't. Um, but increasing their repertoire outside of um, the room and, and transferring to a chair when possible. Some, you know, look, we, I mean, everyone's gonna be different, but that would be a possibility that we could do that we could get them out of the room. Yeah. Um, what about white noise if you wake up to the next day and you're going to check with things? Um, Does, Playing, say, rain or something. Yeah. Rain. So the question is, can we can we play things like white noise or rain in order to sleep? So from an insomnia point of view, uh, this is not something I would use because it has nothing to do with those things. And in fact, what it's doing is you are attempting to sleep. You're putting it on in order to sleep. And sleep effort from an insomnia perspective is like the number one enemy. Right? We want people to be able to sleep on their own. Now, is there a place for white noise? Absolutely, because for, from a, uh, you know, like, there can be noise in the environment, or people with trauma often need to have, uh, or other, you know, even ADHD, they often have to have something in the environment uh, in, in order for them to be settled. But as far as waking up, um, not able to sleep, and turning on white noise as a way of getting back to sleep, um, I would need more time to explain it to you, but that's definitely not something anybody should do. They should actually get up out of bed, wait until it's, you know, until you've settled, and you know, you're feeling sleepy, and then get back into bed. Um, we're not going to do that. In your setting, we don't want, we don't want a lot of off-bed. From a false perspective and management and all kinds of other things, that's not really what we're going to do. So we handle it in, um, in older adults, we would use stimulus control when we get out of the bed. We do something a little different in long-term care facilities, but that's well beyond the scope of what I can talk about. If you want me to ever come back and talk about specific sleep disorders, I'd be very happy to do it. Um, but this was just a more general older adult sleep and thinking about all. Um, we'll probably take two more. <laughs> Colleen, you didn't really talk about medications, and I love that, yeah, this is the general problem. What we see, so for us as staff, whether it be nurse or physician or nurse practitioner, yeah. what would you say about sleep medications? Yeah, so what I would say is that um, I would hope that whoever's prescribing them is paying attention to the, um, um, we don't have a Canadian one right now, I think there's, there's gonna be one coming out soon, but the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, their guidelines for pharmacotherapy. That's what I would want them to follow. And the guidelines are um, to uh, use a essentially um, a, a non-benzobenzo, so some of the Z drugs, um, and to use them that, that cognitive behavior therapy is supposed to be the front line. But in situations in which we can't do that, or it's acute, then we would use a time-limited one of those, and then, and then switching within that class and then eventually they get down to benzos. Um, and in, an old, in older adults, we worry. We worry about uh, we worry about cognitive stuff. We worry about falls. So that's why we don't use those a lot. But unfortunately, what happens is then people then move to off-label things that don't work that are actually on the list of don't use from the American Academy. I mean, the biggest offender for me is trazodone. And melatonin. I mean, melatonin. The, the fact that you would use melatonin as a sleep aid is hilarious to me. I mean, it's not a sleep. It's not a. It's not a hypnotic. It's it's a chronobiotic, and it's being taken at a time where uh, melatonin is already present in the brain. Um, 
And so it, uh, we know that when you take melatonin, when melatonin is in the brain, it does, it, nothing happens. It's like, because um, it's a signal, right? I like, it's like the bat signal, right? You throw the bat signal, I, this is a nerdier, um, <laughs> I didn't mean to use this example. But it's kind of my signal, okay. I mean, so the bat signal's up. So Batman's coming, Commissioner Gordon has thrown it up there, okay? It's not like, you know, making it brighter has a different effect for Batman. He's still coming, right? He doesn't like, oh, I have to like really step on it now. <laughs> like he's still, like, it, so there's no additive effect of taking melatonin. And taking melatonin um, at different times is gonna have different results, but most people take it before bed, which is, uh, it's, there's no effect of it. So, and then the other thing we see, of course, is the use of antipsychotics, especially when people are really anxious. Um, which has, as if, as if that's completely safe and benign as well, when it's really overkill and then they have all these uh, problems during the day. So what we do see is a lot of off-label um, use of medications that are not shown to be effective for sleep out of a disdain for the sleep medications that do actually work without sort of thinking about the sort of cost benefit and without using the behavioral strategies that actually um, would work long term. So I do think there's a good place for sleep medication, but I would be, uh, if it were my loved one, I would want you know it, it to be used according to the guidelines. That's, that would be my take for that. I'm, I'm, also, I'm also not a prescriber. Yes? You were mentioning before about increasing light therapy or light. So just light, light, yeah. So, has there been any studies in long term care homes about uh, light therapy lights? Yeah. Especially in BC. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So, um, I have, in fact, I have a bunch of after these slides of, because I had them and I thought, you know, I'm not going to get into bright light therapy because there are, um, there are a lot of considerations and these ones did not use it and they just used making sure that they're even unnatural light and, and, and attempting to get them outside. So yes, um, they can be used, but there's a couple of things that are tricky. One is that um, some people have um, eye conditions that make it contraindicated or um, certain other um, medications that make them photosensitive that are, there's certain considerations. Um, in addition, um, so light therapy would be a good thing to use, but you'd have to make sure that person was um, uh, good for that. The timing has to be um, uh, not early in the morning because it actually can phase advance them even more. It's hard to explain, but it's too close to what we call in the deer. Um, but light therapy can and is used. In fact, there's a large scale Ontario study, you know, with the Weston Foundation grant right now looking at that. So and yes, so, absolutely. And for how long would they be exposed? Uh, typically, they just use a peripheral box. They're not staring into it. It's not like an old school, like you know, like they almost feel like a light bright that you, yeah. whatever. This is like a peripheral, and it's usually like twenty minutes, uh, and it's usually like ten thousand lux blue light. Yeah. Um, 